This activity is meant to get you to start thinking about uh, controlling systems uh, and understanding all the different ways and different applications where control arises. So I'd like you to write down systems that have some amount of automatic control. This means that there's some sort of computer or microcomputer that's, um, that's regulating something. And, um, and in this case, I want you to write down the state variables, um, which means that what is what is it about the system that's being controlled that's being um, maintained regulated um, fixed something like that so go ahead and write down a few examples and i'll share with you some of mine there are many many different choices that you could have made here um, to describe this i've got a couple so one of the ones that we'll talk about throughout this course is cruise control and so in this case you can think about a car as trying to maintain its speed and so the car is essentially increasing the the acceleration adding some acceleration typically it doesn't decelerate it doesn't uh, cause you to brake um, some of the more advanced cars now with the adaptive cruise control if they see um, an obstacle coming or a car in front of you braking it will also brake so that's uh, that is true and the conventional old school cruise control it simply would coast or it would add some speed um, to regulate that speed so speed is the variable then that we're maintaining in a plane you could do that same thing with the with the forward speed you could also do that with its altitude so in that case you want to maintain a certain altitude 30,000 feet and so there the idea is that it's uh, it's regulating it's either banking the plane um, tipping it up or or tipping it down in order to maintain that altitude. This is a kind of an old school, another old school example, a CD um, or DVD drive. The same thing is true for hard disk drives that are the spinning kind, not solid state. Um, there, essentially, these things work either with a laser head for a CD DVD drive or a magnetic head for a hard disk drive. And the, the important thing is that the distance between, uh, which is essentially related to the focus, um, that distance is being regulated. So the distance between the read head and the disc is, is important to maintain, even though the disc may be a little wonky. Um, and also at the same time, you need to make sure that you're spinning the disc at a precise speed. And so um, both of those are being regulated in the, co in the context of, of these systems. Something like a manufacturing robot. This is something that may pick up a, a circuit or um, some other, like a cap for a bottle, and essentially pick and place it. And so there, it's it's essentially regulating the position, making sure that the position of this piece is finding its way directly to where you want to place it. Uh, finally, my last example is a nuclear reactor. So in this case, the reaction, the nuclear reaction, is um, is kind of squelched or repressed um, the further you insert control rods, which are essentially just these carbon carbon rods that go into the reactor. And so the further you put those in, the more it kind of damps out the, the, the reactions that are happening there. So the hotter the reactor gets, if it gets too hot, then you insert these control rods more and that kind of slows things down and cools it down. And then essentially to maintain the heat that you that you want in the nuclear reactor, you're going to use these control rods in order to maintain that. So these are a couple examples. I encourage you to kind of think about some of the ones that you have, rethink about them, and share them with uh, with people around you to uh, to uh, ex explore the different ways in which control can be used. The last activity highlighted the fact that we find control in many different places and in many different applications. Uh, the ones that we'll particularly be interested in this course are systems that go by the name of dynamic systems. And it's this dynamic label that's particularly uh, interesting to consider and then really understand what that means. And so this means that there's some aspect, some variable that describes the system that is going to change over time. And that, that dependence on time and that kind of evolution, as we'll call it, is something that's characteristic of a dynamic system. And these are found widely throughout engineering, biology, physical sciences, social sciences, and, and uh, in many, many different places. Uh, we've already talked about some examples like aircraft, robots. Uh, you could imagine that 
essentially describing the movement of bones is something that you would do in a biological setting. There's a lot that has to do with um, neuronal behavior that's represented as a changing voltage over time. And over the, over the time scale that's much, much long, longer, you could even think about genetic time scales where you describe the changes of a genetic behavior or genetic characteristic over the time frame of an entire evolution of a, of a species. And then finally, you could even think about, um, you know, essentially stocks that would describe financial systems or behavior in social networks. These are all things that change over time and it makes sense to think about them as dynamic systems rather than as simply static systems. In this course, we're going to think of dynamic systems as the combination of its internal dynamics with its interactions with the environment. And the internal dynamics is a set of rules that the system is going to follow. And oftentimes we'll express those in terms of differential equations. And so those are gonna be set by essentially the physics or the chemistry or the biology or whatever describes that system. That's gonna describe how its state, that's everything that describes the system evolves over time. And there are going to be factors that change that system, and those are going to be our inputs. And there are going to be things that we can know about our system, and those are the outputs. And so oftentimes our measurements, why, these are produced by sensors. And so these are things that we get to observe about the system. Oftentimes it is either a subset or a combination of some of the states of the system. The inputs, the inputs we can decompose into some that we know and some that we don't know. The control inputs, that's U of T, are typically ones that we get to choose or we get to design. And so that is ultimately the goal of this course is figuring out how to set U to achieve desired properties. What makes this difficult, though, is that in addition to things that we can measure our y of t and things that we can control our u of t, we have inputs, some of which we may not be able to control. Um, these exogenous inputs, these are anything else that's, that's impinging upon the system, these could be um, some amount of noise that's related to the system, it could be some unknown disturbance um, that's affecting the system, or it could be something that we do know, such as reference commands. And we'll talk about all of these examples later. And then finally, this is something we won't use a lot in this course, but in addition to sensed outputs, you can also produce other outputs called regulated outputs. This is simply a way of transforming the things that you do know, which is why, into something that you might want to use later. So again, we, we for the most part, won't use Z of T as anything different than, um, than the outputs itself. But this is the overall picture of a dynamic system, which motivates what we want to do with control. So what we do want to do with control is essentially to use our ability to manipulate the control inputs in order to achieve some kind of desired behavior in the outputs. And while we could consider affecting the state, the state is often something we don't know. And so this course is really about an input-output perspective on dynamic systems and designing of those controls. And so before we start talking about what kinds of desired behavior we want to do, we're gonna look at an activity that helps us to understand um, what are the different kinds of mechanisms we could use in order to achieve control? The last activity demonstrated a fundamental difference between types of control that use sensor information and types of control that don't. And so uh, in that activity, I mentioned that uh, we'll use this terminology throughout the course. And this is the distinction between open loop control versus closed loop control. And oftentimes we'll call that feed forward versus feedback. And here in, in the open loop case, this means that the input U does not depend on the output Y. And 
easy example of this that is not exactly much of a dynamical system, but uh, is something that we've all interacted with, is simply a clothes dryer that is on a timer. So here you set it to medium heat and you let it run for 20 minutes. And it doesn't matter if the clothes are really wet or really dry, at the end of the 20 minutes, it's going to, it's going to stop. And so there's nothing about the sensor, in that case there's not even a sensor, a close, uh, moisture sensor, but uh, there's nothing about that sensor that would be fed back. Contrast that with a closed loop system where the output is actually fed back in to the system. And so the example of the clothes dryer, you know, your more modern clothes dryers have some sort of moisture sensor so that when the clothes become dry, it stops the cycle. And so that's a very easy, very simple controller. And the role here of the controller would just be to either continue or to stop. Um, but our job is to be able to design this for much more sophisticated systems and much more complicated control objectives. Building on those very simple block diagrams, we will work with block diagrams a lot in this course. And for the most part, our block diagrams will look something like this. In some cases, they could be simpler. In some cases, they could be a little bit more complex. So we've already seen that our input control signal goes into our system. So our system is indicated by this dashed line. And our system is the combination of actuators and some sort of process dynamics. Um, and it produces the output that we get to, to see. And the output is sampled by this sensor. And that sensor sends information back to the controller. In this case, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, we're explicitly showing that there could be disturbances that could affect the process. There could be sensor noise that affects the value that the sensor is, is, is getting back. So you may not get the output back directly, but you may get some um, slightly perturbed version. And we're also putting in something um, that we'll talk about very soon, which is this idea of a reference. And in this case, the reference is oftentimes the value that we would like to achieve with the controller. So this could be the speed you choose for your cruise control. Um, and um, then the controller's job is to achieve that reference, achieve that speed by measuring the current speed and then applying more acceleration um, if it's required to reach that speed. And so this last box here, this input filter, this could be best thought of right now as essentially a change of units. So in this case, the reference may be specified in miles per hour, but the control signal, if this is a Tesla, maybe the control signal is actually going to be voltage to the actuator, voltage to the motor. And so somewhere in between the reference and uh, the control signal, we need to change units from miles per hour to volts. And so it's possible that that may occur to some extent in this input filter. So another thing that's very important to kind of keep in mind, since this is the first time we're seeing a block diagram, is what the block diagram is telling us. The block diagram encodes signals and transformation of signals. So the wires, these arrows, these wires that, that move the signal uh, from one box to another, these are where the signal lives. So the reference comes in along this signal. The control signal happens along this bit of wire. And you can think about the blocks then as essentially doing math. They change the signal. They transform the signal. They could multiply it by two. They could multiply it by two and divide by three. They could multiply it by two and subtract five. They could do all sorts of different kinds of math. The idea is that you've got signals for example, the output signal coming here, and now the sensor does something. In this case, hopefully it does a pretty good job of measuring the output, but maybe you add in some sensor noise. And so a new signal appears on this edge, and it is should be something very, very similar to the output, um, but it could be slightly different because of, for example, this sensor noise. 
So the role of these blocks is to do math and the edges between the blocks is, um, is this, are the signals that are uh, communicating different values. And these are things that could be viewed, for example, on an oscilloscope. So that seems maybe pretty obvious right now, but this gets more complicated and uh, keeping the difference between the blocks being able to do math and the edges essentially encoding signals is really important. And the last bit that I have not described is this, and this is simply a sum. And in this case, this signal comes in with a positive sign and this signal comes in with a minus sign. And so even though this is a sum, it's really a difference. And so we're computing the difference between the reference and our sensor measurement. Now, before we start talking about specific uh, control problems, the last thing at a very high level we want to talk about are our conventional control goals. And so these can be binned largely into four different categories. And so we'll be talking about these four things. These are the four things we want to achieve with our control designs throughout the whole semester. Um, the first one that we often want to achieve is stability. And so this means that a system should effectively be well behaved. Um, Physically, systems rarely go to in, uh, infinity. That's more of a theoretical kind of idea. But, but I think this idea of stability, that they behave nicely, is something that's rel rather intuitive right now. Um, but we will make that more precise as we move along, what it actually means for a system to be stable. Um, the, the conventional example of something that is not stable is a microphone that gets too close to its speaker and you get that really annoying squelch. And so that's an example of a system that is, that is not stable um, because there's the sound output that's essentially blowing up and causing that painful sound. Our second control objective is going to be to accomplish tracking. And this is where that reference that we talked about on the last slide comes comes around. And so this is the idea that we, we provide some sort of command signal that we'll call a reference, and the output should achieve that as closely as possible. And so we've all used cruise control probably. And so in a cruise control in a car, we all know that if you, for example, go up a hill, all of a sudden the, you can feel the car doing something different. And that's because it's Kind of perceiving the output no longer tracking the speed that you wanted it to and now it has to make changes and so that tracking objective doesn't always have to be a static reference that reference could be something that changes over time and so that goal can be um, kind of arbitrarily complicated another important um, attribute or goal for our control design is that we reject disturbances and this is the idea that if we have some sort of disturbance that's affecting our system, so you can imagine a plane flying and there being a lot of wind, ideally we would like to be able to still maintain our altitude despite the fact that there may be a strong cross breeze. Um, and so we've kind of earmarked that input as this W input, something that we don't always get to design um, and so we need to make sure that we're relatively insensitive uh, to that disturbance input. Uh, finally, our last main control objective is robustness. And so this, this seems a little bit similar to disturbance rejection, but robustness is really the idea that we design all of our controllers um, with a given model or un, uh, understanding about our system. So for example, uh, you may design a system knowing that a spring coefficient is some value, but as that system ages, it's possible for that spring constant to essentially change over time. So if you've ridden in a car that has very loose shocks because it's a lot older than a newer car, you can you kind of experience that in the fact that the, the characteristics of the system can change over time, but ideally we'd like our control goals to still be maintained despite the fact that the system may change, um, or maybe we didn't model it correctly from the beginning. So we're gonna revisit these four control objectives over and over throughout the semester, but it's great to keep these in mind as we go through the examples that we're gonna see, and then we're gonna slowly check these off once we get back to doing um, control in a couple of weeks.
This activity is meant to make you reflect on the, the things that we just discussed about the block diagrams, controllers, um, and how a system is really put together in order to maintain and achieve control. So let's think about, despite the fact that it's still pretty hot outside right now, let's think about the problem of heating a house in the winter. So right now, the outside is cold and you want the inside to be a nice um, temperature. So what we'd like to do is look back at the block diagram uh, that we just talked about and draw a control loop. And in this case, um, try to be specific about what goes in each of the boxes and what those signals are that are going between the different boxes. Um, in the second part, I want you to kind of describe the logic. You already know how a typical thermostat works, so describe the logic of what makes that controller achieve the desired temperature inside the house. In part three, go ahead and draw, essentially as a plot over time, draw, draw what the indoor temperature would look like, um, assuming that the outside is some chilly temperature, say at least 40 degrees, and that you set your thermostat to 65. So what does it look like uh, uh, for the indoor temperature over time? And then finally, discuss, go back to those four different control goals and discuss whether or not this particular um, setup and whether a typical thermostat achieves our four control objectives. So go ahead and write those down, uh, pause the video, chat with your uh, fellow students, and then come back and we'll discuss. So I've made a copy already of the control diagram, essentially the, 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 the block diagram that we have from uh, the previous slide. And now we're gonna customize this for our particular case here. So in this case, the reference, that's our desired temperature. Desired temperature comes in, that's what we would like um, our temperature to be. The thermostat is really not only the controller, but it's also the sensor. So it, it's, it also has something that's monitoring the temperature inside the house and then um, turning the furnace on or off. So there could be a more advanced uh, system where you could have temperature sensors throughout the house that communicate back to a central thermostat that does the control logic. But for the most part, we all have sensor and controller combos in our thermostat. So overall, the plant, the system that's operating um, includes the house, which is really where the dynamics of the system uh, are. And that's essentially the heat leaking out from the house through the windows, the cracks and everything else like that. Um, and that's modeled by this disturbance that we're getting. So this disturbance is the heat loss and the actuator is the combination of the gas valve and the furnace so the, that injects heat into the house and then of course the sensor is reading the actual room temperature and that sensor could also have some noise and uh, we haven't put that into the model here but you could you could uh, you could have put that in there um, so in terms of our four control goals uh, the question is whether it's stable so this system is kind of inherently stable. No, no, no variable is going to blow up. But um, not only that, um, it does achieve our second goal, which is the fact that it tracks it uh, tracks our desired temperature. So, for example, if we wanted our temperature to be about at 65, that it does a pretty good job. And the type of controller in this case is what we will call it. Um, the the community calls this bang bang controller which essentially means it turns on and off so it's an on off type controller so very simplistic logic um, but it does achieve our desired temperature uh, so we achieve some sort of margin above and below and it um, it's going to kind of oscillate back and forth above and below that desired temperature so um, the question is does this operate in the in the in the environment of disturbances and yes it does so it um, you know we're able to still achieve our tracking despite the heat loss that's due to our disturbances our house is not perfectly insulated and it still works um, and um, and then the question about robustness is um, does this work even if there are model uncertainties and in this case 
um, this very, very simple controller uses a very primitive model, which is essentially that heat goes in and then we lose some heat because of some disturbances. So we don't even model the house. Some more modern thermostats could possibly build a, a data-driven model about their about the house uh, insulation and how it, re, uh, how it reflects sunlight and things like that. But by and large, these simple on-off controllers um, are robust because we install that same thermostat and do no calibration uh, in many different houses, apartments, uh, and so on. And so it's a very robust uh, controller mechanism. Um, but we could talk about some inefficiencies of this process. So for example, it could be um, that these tolerances above and below um, are not are not uh, pleasant. So for example, it could be that your your house gets too warm before it decides to start or uh, bef before it stops the um, the furnace or it could get too cold before it starts it back on. So there's a variety of different things um, that a more sophisticated controller could actually achieve. The goal of this activity is to make you realize that you already know some of the most basic types of control. Um, and it'll also help to identify two main distinctions that we have within uh, how we think about controlling systems. So let's take a look at this example. Um, turns out that a pool, a normal sized pool is 50,000 liters, which is mind blowing to me, um, but that's actually the typical volume. So say you had to chlorinate this pool. Um, and in this case, we wanna chlorinate it to three parts per million, or which is essentially three milligrams of chlorine per liter. So I want you to consider three different scenarios, one in which you have no sensors, uh, one in which you have only a water level sensor, and one if you have a chlorine concentration sensor. So in the second case, it'll essentially you can assume that it'll give you the volume of the pool. So nominally it's 50,000 liters, but the water sensor will give you the exact value. Um, in part C, here it'll actually give you the parts per million or the milligrams per liter that the current uh, chlorine level is. And so in each of these cases, it's important to think through what are the assumptions that you make um, without certain sensors or without all the different kinds of sensors you could want, it's, it's difficult to be um, completely precise. And so you need to make sure that you're thinking about the different kinds of assumptions you're making and write those down and then write down a strategy that you think you would use if you had to walk up and do something to this pool. And then after you do that, identify some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these approaches um, and also think about some particular details. For example, think about how, you know, how all of this happens that might make it more difficult uh, to get the concentration perfectly correct, even if you did have all of the information, the perfect sensors that you wanted to have. So go ahead and take a moment uh, and pause the video and, uh, and write down some answers and then we'll go over mine. So in the first scenario, we have no sensors. So you walk up and um, essentially you have to dose this pool uh, with chlorine despite the fact that you don't know its current status. So in this case, you're gonna have to make a couple of assumptions. Right now, you're gonna assume that perhaps there is no existing chlorine. So if this is the first time you're doing this to the pool, maybe, maybe that's your best guess. If you know you serviced the pool last week and you have some estimate about how much it loses per week, then maybe you could choose a slightly different value instead of assuming three milligrams per liter. But if we assume uh, that it has no existing chlorine, then we'll choose this three milligrams um, per liter. And then how much do we need? We need for it for the whole pool. And we're going to go ahead and assume that the pool is completely full at exactly its nominal value, which is 50,000 liters. And so that means that we would have to put in 150 grams of chlorine into the pool. And so this idea of not using any information whatsoever is what we'll refer to throughout the course as either open loop or feed forward. And this open loop concept comes from the fact that there's nothing that's being fed back uh, 
nothing that's coming from the outputs back to the inputs. Um, so now we're going to see two examples of feedback. Um, in the first case, the water level sensor, this now gives us an estimate. Instead of having to assume 50,000 liters, now we can assume, now we can measure what the actual volume is, and we'll call it the variable V, and we're just going to multiply that by how much um, we think that we're off. So again, here we could assume that we have no existing chlorine, or you could make some other best guess. And so this is our first example of feedback because essentially our sensor is giving us information about the volume and we're going to use that to inform what our input should be. In this case, our input is the amount of chlorine in grams. The third option is that we actually have a chlorine concentration sensor. In this case, we don't have a water level sensor, so now we have to make some assumption about how much water there is in the pool. And in this case, now we're going to take the difference between where we want to be, 3 milligrams per liter, and, uh, and essentially where we are now. And so C is then the sensor measurement that's given by the chlorine concentration sensor. So 3 minus C would be the difference, and that's going to uh, now essentially again be an example of feedback where we're taking a sensor output, which is the chlorine concentration sensor, and feeding it back as um, as a, essentially by multiplying it by 50,000 and doing the subtraction, this is now um, using that to feed it back into the input. And so advantages and disadvantages, um, there's some clear advantages to having sensors. So we get maybe a better, better result, we get better accuracy. Um, but I would say that the cost is increasing as you go down here. Having no sensors is very cheap. Um, and it's also very robust. Uh, if the sensor breaks, you have no problem because you have no sensor. Um, a water level sensor is maybe a little bit more expensive, a little bit more complicated. If it breaks, then you're out of luck. Um, a chlorine concentration sensor, sensor, that certainly sounds fancier than a water level sensor. And so I could imagine that costing more money and uh, perhaps even being more prone to failure. So in addition to these kind of advantages and disadvantages, there's also some kind of nasty complications. Um, so for example, we're going to measure the volume, we're going to measure the concentration. Um, there could be some sort of inaccuracies. So it could be that um, either there's some sort of biased value um, because of environmental factor, maybe temperature affects these readings, um, or it could just be a noisy reading. Sometimes the cheaper the sensor, the, the more noisy it will be. Um, once we come up with this value that we want to dose, we may actually not dose 150 grams. We may dose something more like 145, for example, depending on how accurate the actuator is here. It depends on whether or not we're going to um, be able to achieve the actuation, the input that we desired. So that's another possible complication. And then another one is simply the fact that depending on how you add that in, it could be, and how fast this feedback uh, occurs, um, you could experience some delays in mixing time. So for example, you could dump 150 grams into the pool, but it's gonna take possibly a couple hours for that to propagate through the pool. And so you could experience, um, essentially the controller could try to decide to add more chlorine while it's still mixing. And so in that case, you'd over chlorinate your pool. So in addition to kind of the, the various options that you have in terms of feed forward versus feedback and their pros and cons, you also have some of these complications that will arise in a real system. And so um, these are all really interesting things to kind of survey now at the beginning and then come back to as we start to talk about the distinctions between these different options.